Greetings and a hearty hello. My name is David Alexander and these are my initials. Today I want to talk to you about February 2nd. To many a day to watch a fat rodent make a 50-50 decision about weather. For me though, it marks an event that is mostly overlooked in history, where courageous teams of people and much more productive quadrupeds risked life and limb to save the lives of a town on top of the world. Well, at least it was mostly overlooked until the release of Balto in 1995. The film centers around the 1925 outbreak of diphtheria in Nome, Alaska, and the journey of its main protagonist, Balto, racing against time to get the cure back to the people before it's too late. Well, at least too late for this one girl in particular. Anyway, in celebration of the anniversary of this event, I thought I'd give the flick a watch. Being based on a true story, I did a little digging to learn more about the actual events of the Nome Serum Run, as it's commonly called, and I'll be sharing little tidbits and observations of the real event throughout. Why wait to get started? Let's mush right in, this is Balto. So even though this is primarily an animated film, we start out with a live action scene in New York City. An interesting choice, but not a bad one in my opinion. They only use it in the beginning and the end as a way to establish a stronger connection to our real world, so it never feels like the animated and live scenes are distracting from one another. A little girl and her grandma are wandering through Central Park, looking for a memorial. But it was here. Some place. But we've already been past here. <laughs> they are a bit lost as the grandmother has not been there in many years, so they decide to take a seat and rest for a bit as she starts to tell her granddaughter the story. In the cold winter of 1925, it was snowing hard. Based on this transition, we assume she narrates throughout the whole movie, but we never hear from her again until the end. I don't see this as bad. Narrators are not always a good thing, especially if the story can speak for itself. Eh, <laughs> get it? Movie about dogs can speak for it. Never mind. Anyway, we jump into a dog sled race. These were very commonplace at the time, as sled teams were really the best way to transport goods between remote communities. Sadly, this job would go out of trade as aviation got better, and the advent of snowmobiles filled the need in the latter half of the century. By the way, one of these dogs is the movie's villain. I'll let you try to guess which one. As the racers approach the town, we see the first look at our movie's hero. His butt. Interesting introduction. When we do finally see his face, we see that he's pretty darn cute which will inevitably lead to loads of fan art for decades to come. Not as much as Jenna, but we'll get to her in a minute. Balto is played by Kevin Barkin. I mean, Bacon. Sorry. <laughs> I'll quit it with the dog puns. I promise. We also get to meet Boris the Goose. He is Balto's mentor and friend. He'll spend most of his screen time complaining. I hate going into town. Uh. Hey, let's go! Why do I let you talk me into these things? Not that I blame him, as he seems to go through the most comic suffering in the film, even nearly losing his head in the very first scene he's in. The first historical inaccuracy I have to point out that might be a shock to most is in real life, the dogs didn't talk. So as Boris and Balto head to watch the race, our next scene introduces us to our adorable, lovable, red-headed girl for the film, Jenna the Husky. Oh my gosh, she is so cute. I just want to take her home. Who's your good puppy? Who's your good puppy? Yes, you bar Jenny. Sorry about that. We also meet Rosie, Jenna's owner. She's pretty likable too, and it's clear that there's a great bond between owner and sled dog. Remember that because it will be an important part of a point I'm going to make later, but I'll get to that. Jenna and Rosie also share a bit of a physical resemblance. As I mentioned before, Jenna has seen a lot of fan art love, and by far, in my opinion at least, has the most appealing character design in the movie. Believe it or not, she is actually modeled after the actress Audrey Hepburn, who sadly passed away a few years before this movie was released. Not that she was involved in the production in any way, but it was a nice way to pay homage to her. You can also see some of Audrey's resemblance in Rosie. While towing Rosie to watch the race in her new sled, Jenna strikes up some casual conversation with some local dogs, Dixie and Sylvie. Close race, don't you think? Maybe even neck and neck. Say something about her new caller before she gets whiplash. <laughs> okay, 
I know I'm supposed to be listening to what they're saying, but I'm completely distracted by this random dog in the background ogling over the ladies. I don't know why, it just it really cracks me up. Good on you, movie. So as the race comes to an end, we see Rosie losing her hat and Balto going to great lengths to rescue it. This, of course, displeases Steel, the lead dog of the winning team, who, if you hadn't guessed by now, is a total selfish jerk. This also leads to another thing that makes me chuckle, this scream from Boris. <laughs> Sounds even funnier sped up. <laughs> Rosie is pleased with Balto's actions, as is Jenna. And they called it puppy love. This, however, does not please her father, who is quick to shoo him away for being half wolf. Might bite you, honey. He's part wolf. This sentiment is quickly reciprocated by Steel and his goons, Muscles, Rambles, and Stupid. No, that's not their real names, but they may as well be, because that's their personalities in a nutshell. This leads to Balto sulking for a bit in his makeshift home on a wrecked ship. Pretty cool home, in my opinion. Most of our hero's turmoil in the film comes from this inner struggle of being halfway between two worlds. Not a dog. Not a wolf. All he knows is what he is not. Yes, well put, Boris. I think this is as good a time as any to take a look at the real Balto. After all, in reality, wolf dogs are a highly unstable breed, so fear of these animals is not completely unwarranted. So I was intrigued to learn how circumstances brought about Balto's integration into the real gnome scenario. How did a wolf dog find his way into the hearts of the town? Well, he didn't. Wait, what? Don't misunderstand. Balto did a great deed that was vital to saving the people of Gnome, and I'll get to that later. But Balto was not half wolf. He wasn't even part wolf. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to the real Balto, a purebred Siberian husky. Not a wolf. Oh man, but I even named a plush wolf after him. Don't judge me. Now don't get me wrong, the real Balto is adorable, but it's so strange that the primary conflict our main character is struggling with throughout the entire movie has nothing to do with the original animal. This is actually what springboarded my interest to dig deeper into the history of these events. But I'll get back to that later when it becomes more relevant. While we're on the subject, how do the rest of the characters stack up in reality? Well, not surprised. Meh. Hmm. Really? Don't tell me that means that- Aww, not Jenna. Oh, now who's Balto gonna have a puppy family with? Oh. Awkward. Yes, interestingly enough, Balto's the only character in the movie based on a real-life person. Or dog, rather. This becomes a major problem for me later, but I'll bring it up when it's most relevant. For now, let's get back to the flick. While Boris tries to pull Balto out of his melancholy, we get introduced to the film's biggest mistakes. I mean, two more characters, Muck and Luck. How to say that carefully. They're the sort of adopted, uh, friends, random tagalongs to our protagonist. For whatever reason, they seem awfully fond of Boris, constantly referring to him as Uncle. We love you, Uncle Boris. Yes, please, Uncle Maybe. Boris. Oh no. How sweet. Uncle Boris. Boris, though, seems to want nothing to do with them. I don't blame him. They are stupid and annoying. Despite this, Balto always seems to treat them with patience and compassion. Easy, Boris. You know how they are. Hey, come on, you're okay, you're not drowning. Good for you, Balto, but you can have him. I'm with Boris. These guys give me a headache. Even at his worst, Boris as a comic relief is tolerable. At their best, these guys are still irritating. I'm skipping their scenes, and I won't apologize for it. Woe is us. Despite her being fictional, Balto can't get Jenna off his mind and goes into town for some casual flirtation. It's a shot in the dark, but I was wondering if, uh... I don't know, maybe you'd like to go chase a few sticks by moonlight, uh... <laughs> Jenna has other things on her mind, though, as Rosie seems to be falling ill. <laughs> Rosie! Rosie! Come on, you're gonna catch your death out here. Catch your death out here? Nice choice of words, guy, jeez. Good foreshadowing, though. Balto quiets his hormones long enough to realize the weight of the situation and helps sneak Jenna under the doctor's office for a closer listen on Rosie's condition. But not before Balto distracts her with a pretty cool little trick with broken bottles. Yeah. Beautiful. 
Their puppy love will have to wait, though, as the doctor entering the room spoils their romantic moment, reminding them why they were down there in the first place. Or at least why Jenna was. I'm watching you, Balto. Balto? <laughs> Big Paw's kinda running my family. They overhear that Rosie has diphtheria. For those unfamiliar, diphtheria is no laughing matter. You can look up the specifics at your own discretion, but it's caused by a bacterial infection and can lead to horrible skin lesions, graying of the skin, terrible respiratory tract issues, and cardiac problems that can lead to death. Yikes. Luckily, there's an antitoxin that can counteract the toxins secreted by the bacteria, but its best chance of working depends on early delivery. Unfortunately, it seems they're fresh out. So an urgent call goes out to get the antitoxin, or serum as it's commonly referred to. To their dismay, the winter conditions in the air and at sea are stopping its immediate delivery to Nome. The best they can do is get it delivered by rail to Nanana. From there, it's determined that the best way, well, the only way really, to deliver it to Nome is by dog sled. Also, Genolite steals butt on fire. So yeah, don't mess with Jenna. A race is held the next day to determine the fastest dogs to put on the serum retrieving sled team. Determined to help Rosie, Balto enters himself into the race. Despite being thrown off the track, he, of course, takes first place. This displeases Steel, who steps on his paw at just the right moment to make him look dangerous to the humans, thereby disqualifying from the team. Which leads to some more Balto sulking. I might turn on you. Yep, as long as there's hope for those kids, I'll keep this lit. It'll guide the team back. History side note. The red glowing lamp was added just for the movie. However, Gnome's church steeple had an electric cross on top of it that was commonly used as a beacon for dog sled teams. So as Steel and the gang head off to save the day, I have to admit, this is where I get a little bothered. Up until now, I've been pretty lenient with the history. Most of the differences have been minor, but this is a little much for me. Tell them why, Jenna. It's not exactly a one-dog show, Dixie. Right you are, girl. Here we see one team being sent to do the entire round trip. The reality is, it took 20 teams comprising of over 100 dogs to pull it off. It was also not a round trip. Sled dogs were dispatched starting at Nanana all the way along the route to Nome. I mean, other towns had sled dog teams too, guys. With all those teams involved, you'd think there would be some interesting stories about the journey. And you'd be right. The storm they were riding through, day and night mind you, was one of the worst Alaska had seen in a long time, and that's saying a lot for Alaska. With hurricane force winds chilling the temperature to minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the very first relay team lost two dogs to the cold. Another had to have hot water poured on his hands to remove them from his sled. Another still ran alongside his sled team to keep from freezing. One man even attached his sled to himself after he lost his lead dogs, pulling it the rest of the way. And all of this was just to get it halfway. The next to take over was the team that is commonly called the true hero of the serum run, led by Leonard Seppla and his lead dog Togo. Their team alone traveled five times farther than any other team and did so in record-setting time. This journey required them to travel over a frozen body of water twice, the second time of which the ice was incredibly unstable. They also traversed Little McKinley Mountain requiring a 5,000 foot uphill climb. Togo himself has an amazing backstory. I'll give you the short version. As a puppy, he had a throat condition that he, of course, survived from, but it left him weak. Seppla didn't think he would amount to much, so he gave him away to be someone's pet rather than a sled dog. Fiercely loyal to his owner, though, Togo jumped through a glass window just to get back to him. At that point, Seppla knew he was something special, but thought he was still too small of a dog to be on the team. Togo's heart was destined to be a sled dog, though, and his persistence led him deep into Seppla's heart and to the front of his team. From sickly runt to Seppla's best friend and first choice of dog in competition, Togo's journey was an amazing one before he even set foot on the serum run trail. What's more, Togo was 12 years old at the time of the serum run, which was considered well past retirement for most sled dogs. But Seppla could think of no more trustworthy dog and loyal friend to have at the front of his team for such an important mission. Why have I told you all this? Because I think it's interesting, that's why. What I find even more interesting is that none of this made it into the movie. Granted, Balto did play a very important role, and I'll get to that a little later. But after learning about all these stories, I was honestly baffled that they would make so much time for non-existent characters <laughs> when there was such a wealth of interesting experiences that deserved to be told, especially Togo's. 
His story alone is enough to carry a movie. This is, in my opinion, the biggest missed opportunity of the movie. Togo was an amazing dog who crippled himself to get the serum through despite all the odds that stacked against him throughout his life. You're a good boy, Togo. This video is for you. Now, don't misunderstand. I like the movie's characters. I like their looks, personalities, and interactions. Well, most of them. But with all the time and effort put into them, they could have made room for some of the amazing stories and characters previously mentioned. Anyway, back to the flick. After making the entire journey from Gnome to Nanana, Steel and friends start to head back with a serum. But it doesn't take long before they get lost. I do like this scene because it's showing some of the treacherous conditions they were trying to get through. It wasn't just running across flat plains of snow. News of their absence, of course, sends a wave of hopelessness through the town as they don't think the infected children are going to make it. Although the only one we really ever see sick is Rosie, despite the fact that diphtheria is incredibly contagious. So Balto, Boris, Beavis, and Butthead venture forth to find the missing team, who at the moment are crashing down a cliff. Nice move, Steel. Now, I haven't talked a lot about Steel yet. For the most part, he's just a typical jerk, much like Gaston in Beauty and the Beast. He is liked by many for his accomplishments, but at the end of the day, he only cares about himself, even if it costs others dearly. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. What I want to say about Steel is, he cracks me up. <laughs> not really in an intentional way on the part of the animators. I mean, he doesn't have any funny lines, but... <laughs> I swear, every time I pause the movie in a shot with Steel, the <laughs> look on his face is hilarious. This guy is like a walking Caption Me contest. Meanwhile, Balto and crew are moseying along when they run into a small woodland creature. I would say the size of this bear makes no sense in reference to the polar bears, but then I'd have to give them screen time to prove it. When it looks like Balto is about to get axed, Jenna comes to save the day. Ah, Jenna, is there anything you can't do? The ensuing fight leads Balto and the bear onto a frozen lake, where they both fall in. It looks like Balto's trapped beneath the ice until... <laughs> He saves himself. Yeah, he, he saves himself. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Jenna does her best to warm up Balto, clearly showing she has no respect for personal boundaries, but I'm sure he's not complaining. Jenna is hurt though, and it's up to Boris to bring her home. I'd say Boris and the bears, but as far as I'm concerned, they drowned in the last scene, and no one will miss them. So now it's up to Balto to charge ahead and find the missing team all on his own. Which is what he was going to do originally, anyway. And with seemingly minimal effort, he does. After Steel pulls the old testosterone routine of We don't need your help, a fight ensues and he gets himself thrown off a cliff. Again, nice move, Steel. Now, if you remember earlier, when we saw Jenna for the first time, I said you needed to remember the clear bond between Musher and Dog. Well, here's why. In the real Serum Run, and in many Sled teams in real life, there's a deep bond of friendship between the Dog teams and their Musher. To bring the Serum in, they were running their dogs harder than normal, something that takes a great deal of loyalty to do. And with the Mushers, many of them suffered frostbite while trying to take measures to save their dogs. This kindred bond was a vital part of what made the whole run possible. Throughout this movie, with that one exception of Jenna and Rosie, there seems to be a huge disconnect between the dogs and their drivers. It's utilitarian at best. Again, I feel this did a great injustice to the real teams who risked everything to make this happen. Most of this was to try to make Steel look bad, and I'd hate to say it, but I don't think the movie needed him. Yeah, he was good for a few freeze frame laughs, but I think that Diphtheria and the Winter Storm were villain enough. With all that time spent on him making Balto's day worse, one could only wonder what elements could have been put in his place. I'll still take him over the polar bears any day though. I hate bears! Thank you, Boris. Speaking of dastardly deeds, Steel is feeling fine after falling off a cliff. 
and decides to follow Balto's Mark Trail home, but ruin it in the process, potentially dooming the team and the whole town. That's pretty low, Steel. What can I say? It's good to be bad. Ironically, rather than admit he can't find the way because of Steel's vandalism, Balto sort of does the exact thing Steel did. He pretends he knows the way, which ultimately makes them crash and Balto falls off a cliff with the serum. Don't worry about me, guys. I'm just fine. The box broke my fall. Oh. Back in Gnome, Steel returns giving a typical bad guy liar speech about what happened. Steel's lying. Yep. Meanwhile, it seems all hope is lost for poor Rosie, who still seems to be the only one with diphtheria. Jenna, proving to be quite the talented pup, carries a lit lantern and a pile of broken glass up a hill to shine a signal of hope out to the team. She seems to be the only one who still believes that they're coming home. Maybe she read the script. I'm beginning to see there isn't anything you can't do. Feeling particularly not dead, Balto gathers all his strength by finding his inner wolf, as well as a random outer wolf, and pulls the medicine up the cliff. But not before doing his best sad puppy face. Getting the box back to the top, they are on their way again. The only thing standing in their way is everything in nature constantly trying to kill them. Makes good trailer fodder, though. Uh, actually, all of the serum made it safely in the real serum run. Just, just saying. Again in Gnome, we see Rosie finally pass the disease to more people, making the need for the medicine all the more critical. As if right on cue, Balto howls his way into town with the serum in tow. Yay! Now, for those of you who've been burning to know Balto's real contribution to the serum run, now's the best time to bring it up because they sort of partially got it right. Balto was the lead dog on the last sled team in the relay. Therefore, it's technically correct that he brought the antitoxin into Gnome. However, there were 19 brave teams that came before him. In the words of Jenna, It's not exactly a one-dog show, Dixie. Again, right on the nose, girl. She really is smart. Who's your good girl? Who's... Sorry. Balto's role was significant, though, and his story is pretty interesting as well. Balto's musher, not gonna try to pronounce that, was a talented up-and-coming musher who worked for Leonard Seppla, who owned both Togo and Balto. Interestingly, he was actually not supposed to be the last runner in the relay. When he reached the pass-off point, the next driver was asleep, believing that the relay had stopped to wait out the dreadful storm conditions. Unwilling to lose the time it would take to wake up the other guy and get a whole new team harnessed up, he pressed on for the final leg to Gnome. The conditions were some of the worst of the relay. Visibility was so poor, he couldn't even see the dogs harnessed right in front of him. The winds were so harsh, the sled was actually blown over, losing the serum in the snow. He spent several minutes digging through the snow in bare hands to find it again, getting frostbite in the process. Through the blinding wind and the deadly cold, Balto charged on, leading the team forward through the dead of night, finally bringing the antitoxin into town just after 3 a.m. local time. Balto's accomplishment and contribution to the people of Gnome is nothing short of spectacular, and he justifiably earns his place in the history books. However, he was not the only one, and arguably not the biggest contributor to the miracle in Gnome. The Race of Mercy, as it's also called, was a massive ensemble. It took the dedicated efforts and sacrifice of so many to make it happen. This had to succeed. No one person in the chain could afford to give up, or the efforts of everyone who came before him would be in vain. The bonds and trust between the men, their animals, and each other took the Anatoxin 674 miles in just five and a half days, stopping the epidemic in its tracks. One thing the movie tragically got right was Balto's extreme praise immediately following the run. He lived a complicated life after the run, actually. He went to the lower United States to do tours around the country. He even starred in a movie entitled Balto's Run to Gnome as well as many vaudeville acts across the states. Sadly, he and his remaining serum team were sold to a circus show where they spent most of their time locked in a dark room tied to their sled as a cheap attraction. 
Luckily, their poor living conditions didn't go unnoticed, and they were eventually rescued and taken to a zoo in Ohio, where they lived comfortably for the rest of their lives. And as a matter of fact, you can still see Balto there today. Yeah, they stuffed him. As for Togo, he would go on his own little tour of America, after which he retired with a breeder and a good friend of Sepla's in Maine, where he would spend his final years. Sepla recalled, I have never had a better dog than Togo. His stamina, loyalty, and intelligence could not be improved upon. Togo was the best dog that ever traveled the Alaska Trail. You can also see Togo on display at the Iditarod headquarters in Wasilla, Alaska. As for the movie, it looks like the serum made it in time as the town rejoices and embraces Balto as a hero. Jenna gives Balto a flirty, nuzzly welcome home, and stupid rattles off that they should make a statue of him. Oh, they should build a statue of him! Which, of course, they did, as our live-action duo now shows us. By the way, for those who are curious, yes, they also made a statue of Togo. It's located at the same zoo in Ohio where Balto and his serum team lived out the rest of their lives. <laughs> Balto really did do all of that, didn't he, Grandma? Oh yes, sweetheart, he really did. Uh, no he didn't. But he certainly helped. And today they run the Iditarod dog race over the very path he and the others took. Uh, no they don't. The Iditarod path is actually based on older races, but it's dedicated to the gnome run. And we get our final revelation that the grandmother was Rosie this whole time, as the Based on a True Story title brings us to the credits and a typical 90s credit sounding song. So that was the story of Balto, both real and fictional. In regards to the real story, I can't do it justice. Balto's contributions were heroic to say the least, but he was certainly not the only hero of the story. And honestly, neither was Togo. It took large teams of incredibly dedicated and brave people to make this happen. If it interests you, I would highly recommend looking into it more. If you want to do some reading, there's a book called The Cruelest Miles that chronicles the events pretty well. There's also a little children's mini-novel written from Togo's point of view called Dog Diaries No. 4. It's technically fiction, but the majority of the story is directly based on the true events of his life. Sadly, the movie Balto is not quite as tactful in its adhesion to the real events. Even so, it's still a great movie. You have to take the based on a true story aspect with a grain of salt. It's not a documentary, so it shouldn't be treated as one. It's a movie meant to entertain. For what it is, honestly, I still love it. Even after all the historical flaws I learned about. Balto is extremely likable. Jenna is always great when she's on screen. And I have to admit, I even like Boris. Even if he can be a little over the top. I like Rosie too. They didn't make her overly annoying, which is really easy to do with children in films most of the time. I cared about what happened to these characters. I wanted to see them succeed. I even like the romance between Balto and Jenna. They didn't string us along with misunderstandings or them arguing or pretending not to like each other. Sometimes a simple romance is nice. Another wonderful thing in this movie is the music, done by James Horner who tragically passed away last year. His heart and talent will always live on through this and many other unforgettable works. I would be lying though if I said my research hadn't changed how I see certain aspects of the movie. As fun as Steel is to watch sometimes, trying to force a villain into the story also forced some of the potential heart of the real event out. Jim Cummings is a wonderful actor, best known for voicing Half Your Childhood, but I think he could have sat this one out and let the film be more about the serum run itself. The struggle to accomplish the task is conflict enough. I particularly think the movie could have done without the polar bears, though. Especially when you consider the amazing story of Togo and all he did. The thought that he was cast aside for the sake of a cheap, annoying comic relief is honestly hard to swallow. I feel they put these elements in here because this movie came out right in the middle of the Disney Renaissance, which if you're not familiar with what that is, it's where Disney had a massive revival in their animation studio. Because of the success of movies like Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and Lion King, other movie studios tried to adopt similar behaviors in their movies. Follow the Disney recipe, per se. In most of these movies, you had a charming lead, a love interest, a creepy villain, and a quirky comic sidekick. It's a shame that they chose to do it this way. Because other movies like 
all dogs go to heaven and the land before time didn't follow this formula and they're critically acclaimed as time goes on, even if they weren't huge box office hits at the time. I feel like the historical event should have told the story, rather than forcing it to fit into previously established archetypes. Again, I still love the movie, flaws and all, and I'll continue to watch it again and again for years to come. In the end, even if it's not 100% accurate, the movie did do a great thing. It got people interested in this amazing and otherwise unknown chapter of history. Balto is a great dog in real life, and he makes a great wolf dog in fantasy. They're both worth your time of day to check out. Just be sure not to forget all the other hounds and humans that made his leg of the journey possible. Especially Togo. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my very first movie review. It sincerely means so much to me. Feel free to let me know what you think. I don't bite. Take care, have a wonderful day, and I hope you can find many reasons to smile today.